Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wow, this is such a wonderful audience to have uh, joining us this afternoon uh, here at Museum London. Thank you for joining us on the final weekend of Words, London's Literary and Creative Arts Festival. My name is Josh Lambier, and I'm the Artistic Director of Words. It's a special privilege to greet all of you uh, this afternoon because we're hosting this event as part of a milestone year for the Words Festival. It's our 10th anniversary this year. So 10th anniversary at Museum London. I'm heartwarmed to see so many gathering here this afternoon in this brilliant space, the Centre at the Forks. A little sunny, but you know, we've got a little shade, so we're all, we're all good there. Uh, this does have the best view of the, the river and the city beside us today, uh, as you saw when you came in. Um, Museum London offers us a gathering place at the forks of Dashkan Zivi, or Antler River, also known as the Thames, a site of regional identity and indigenous history, a site to consider how art, creativity, and big thinking can reimagine a more equitable world, uh, something that we need to think about now more than ever. Words takes place on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapuak, and Shinocton peoples. This land is home to diverse Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and the water and as vital contributors to our community and, of course, to the Words Festival. It's my honour to have the opportunity to host this afternoon's distinguished guest, two-time winner of the Stephen Leacock Memorial Medal for Humour Writing, Terry Fallis, who will be joining us to talk about his new best-selling novel, A New Season. Terry's new novel marks a departure from his previous works, as you're going to discover this afternoon. It brings a thoughtful exploration of aging, loss, family, friendship, and love, all with Terry's acclaimed wit, humor, and generosity of spirit. Our theme for the festival this year, Crisis, Creativity, and Care, is very much reflected in Terry's new book. Coming out of the pandemic, or at least the worst of it, we hope, I wanted to feature works that confront the crises of our moment with creativity and care. Without giving away too much of the book, I was struck by the way in which the protagonist of the novel, Jack McMaster, became resilient in the midst of his own experience of crisis. And by turning towards his creativity, his family, and a renewed sense of self-care. It's such an elegant and heartwarming fit for the festival and our theme this year. And I couldn't think of a better guest for our final weekend of the Words Festival. I would like to recognize the generous support of the Ontario Arts Council, the London Arts Council, and the Community Arts Investment Program, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, all supporters who allow us to keep this festival largely free during the pandemic and after. My warm thanks to Museum London staff. This is our final day at Museum London uh, of the festival weekend. We have a couple of events tomorrow too. Um, Kim Fawner and Francis Boyle, who are here with us right here, will be reading at TAP Center for Creativity. So I would highly recommend that uh, for tomorrow as well. But this is our final day at Museum London, and I would really like to thank the staff for everything that they do to make this possible. This is a gorgeous space, and uh, it's the home of words. It's a real pleasure to welcome someone who I and many others regard as one of Canada's finest humorists and novelists. His first novel, The Best Laid Plans, won the 2008 Leacock Medal for Humor, was named the 2011 winner of CBC's Canada Reads, and became a CBC television series and stage musical. In 2015, he won the Leacock Medal a second time for his fourth novel, No Relation. I also have a very special affection for Terry's novel, Albatross, which is about a young golf prodigy who skyrockets to sports stardom, and yet he doesn't really like golf, but wants to become a writer. I gave it to my father, who happens to be here tonight, uh, <laughs> I didn't know he was coming, but this is even better now. I'm going to embarrass him. Uh, <laughs> he's a retired banker, a widower, and obsessed golf enthusiast who found he had an unexpected and even unwanted amount of time at home 
also known as the coronavirus pandemic lockdown. And to my complete surprise, he asked me one day for a book recommendation. In all of my years studying literature, talking about books, organizing a festival about books, he had never asked for a book recommendation ever. Uh, so I gave him a copy of Terry Fallis's book on a Friday, and by the beginning of the next week, I got a call. Well, I finished the book, it was terrific. What else can you recommend by Terry? <laughs> So I was gobsmacked, completely gobsmacked by this. And uh, what I think this testifies to is Terry has accomplished a feat that neither I nor my brothers could achieve over the years. Uh, he, he got my father reading and continues to read Terry's books and others, uh, even when the golf courses became open again. <laughs> Terry's writing is a testament to the power of literature to lift us all up during difficult times of crisis and change. And I can't think of a better person and a better reason uh, for uh, a driving motivation to host a literary festival uh, for the creative arts. Uh, now more than ever, uh, this is why we do it. Terry's new book, A New Season, as you will see, shows us all that sometimes making a change in our lives can save your life. Please join me in welcoming back to London, Terry Fallis. Oh, doesn't Josh give the best intros? <laughs> I mean, that was amazing. That I'm going to see if Josh will come to like me, them. come with and me to other events I'm doing, and uh, maybe stand in and introduce me. Josh, thank you. Thank you for having me back. It's always wonderful to, to be in London. Uh, I can't recall how many festival appearances I have made here, but a, uh, I've enjoyed every one of them, and aren't we lucky to have a festival like this uh, in London? So thank you, Josh, and happy anniversary. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, uh, this new novel. Um, it is a bit of a departure for me, and we'll get into that in a minute. Of course, you know what this is. It's my novel in a nutshell slide. <laughs> I know that's kind of lame, isn't it? But uh, uh, let me just share with you some of the themes that are in this novel, and then we'll go into a bit more detail about them. First of all, it is a, a novel largely about love, loss, and recovery. Uh, and I'll come back to why I, I did that, because that's part of the departure. It's a novel about aging. In all my other novels, I have never written a narrator who is my own age, which tells you how old I think I am inside. Uh, and as I come to grips with being 63, okay, I thought some of you might go, really? <laughs> but no, okay. That's part of coming to grips with it is... I am 63. Uh, I, I decided to give that uh, challenge to my narrator in the hopes that I might learn something from his travails as he comes to grip with, the, with his own age. Uh, male friendship. We don't have that many novels that uh, tackle the question of male friendship. I think women do friendship so much better than men do. Uh, but I wanted to explore male friendship, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Of course, when you have love, loss, recovery, aging, male friendship, you have to have songwriting as one of the themes uh, in the novel. And if you have those four themes, the logical conclusion to that is 1920s Paris. <laughs> yes, when I look back at writing this novel, I have no idea why I chose to try to bring together five seemingly disparate, disconnected themes uh, and bring them all together. But that, this is just the story that was emerging in my adult brain pan uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, as for settings, uh, the novel really is set in two places. Toronto, particularly the community of Riverdale, uh, sort of in the east side of Toronto, on the other side of the Don Valley and the Don Valley Parkway, which may be more familiar to you than the actual Don Valley, uh, and Paris, particularly the left bank, and we'll come back to that. So what's behind this story? Well. If you've read my other novels uh, or heard me speak before, you may recall that I am a member in good standing of the Write What You Know School of Writing. You can find pieces of me and pieces of my life strewn about the pages of my novels. I continue to say, not in an autobiographical way, I'm actually not writing about me. I just find it easier to write with authenticity and conviction and authority 
if I'm writing about worlds that I know, issues that I'm interested in or passionate about and experiences I've had, but I'm not in the stories, certainly not in this one. My wife is alive and well. Um, so in this novel, as uh, Josh mentioned, uh, when I submitted it to my, my editor at, uh, at McClellan and Stewart, and they read it through, we worked through the editing process, and then they sent it to the marketing team, and the marketing team come, came up with this for the back of the, of the, uh, the novel, a novel unlike any of his others. I don't know if they mean my other novels haven't been a thoughtful approach to something. <laughs> I don't think that's what they mean, but, uh, but when, when you see a line like that on the back of your novel, you're not really sure that you, you want to see that kind of line. But when you see a line like that, it brings an elephant into the room. And if you uh, have read any or some of my other novels, uh, I think this raises the question, the elephant in the room, is it funny? Because uh, if, if I'm no one for anything, and, and I may not be, but if I am, it might be for novels that should make you laugh and I hope make you think now and then as you read your way through them. Uh, but this one, uh, is it funny? I think it is funny in places, but there's a bit of a deeper emotional range in this story than in my others. If some of you have read it, you may know of what I speak. Uh, but it is just the novel that uh, sort of wanted to be written, which is not something I usually say about my stories. So really, what's behind the story? Well, in a funny way, John Irving is behind the story. Any John Irving fans in the house? He is probably my all-time uh, favorite uh, novelist. Uh, if you would ask me to tell you my favorite novel of all time, which is a terrible thing to ask an inveterate reader, but I might be forced to tell you a prayer for Owen Meany. <clears throat> and I read that in 1989, I think it was, and it affected me so much, I have not read it since. So I have such trepidation about reading it now, all these years later, but many people have assured me that it holds up. Uh, but uh, John Irving, uh, he, because he is my all-time favorite uh, writer, you, do, you know he's now a Canadian citizen. He lives in Toronto. Uh, and uh, my friend Shelley Macbeth, who runs Blue Heron Books in Uxbridge and is the artistic director of the Book Drunkard Festival. It's a great name, and the, the, word, the phrase book drunkard comes from Lucy Maud Montgomery. She described herself that way. I'm just a book drunkard. And Lucy Maud Montgomery spent some of her uh, life living in Uxbridge, hence the connection. Uh, but John Irving had agreed to come to the, uh, the festival, and Shelley Macbeth, knowing of my uh, idolatry of, uh, of uh, John Irving, asked me if I would introduce him. And I, I said yes, without knowing whether I was even in the country at that time. Uh, and uh, last, no, about a year ago now, in November last year, I got the uh, opportunity to meet John Irving. We met in the, uh, this part is not related to my novel, this is just me reminiscing about an, an important moment in my life uh, as a writer. Uh, we met in the green room and, and chatted, and he was just charming. Uh, I introduced him. I think I remember saying in my introduction that I was trying to make it an introduction about John Irving and not about John Irving and me. <laughs> but that was very hard. Uh, afterwards, we had, we spent, uh, had a three-hour dinner in a restaurant in Exbridge that was uh, closed to the public. Uh, and I sat right across from him pinching myself every 30 seconds or so, and he has great stories to tell, and it was such a lovely evening. And were that not enough, uh, about a month later, John emailed me. I call him John. <laughs> I don't really to his face, but just in settings like this. Uh, and he, he emailed me and said, I'm doing this event at the Babington Racquet Club in Toronto. Would you introduce, or would you interview me on stage? And uh, again, I said yes before knowing I was going to be in the country or not. Uh, and we worked back and forth on email about what we would cover, and then, yeah, I got to interview him on stage, which was uh, wonderful. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. John Irving once said, and he said, he said this in various ways over the years because I have watched every interview he's ever given on YouTube. Uh, he says, I've always written about what I fear, what I'm afraid of, and what I hope never happens to me or to anyone I love. Uh, and that sentiment was echoing in my brain pan as I considered what my n next novel would be, 
when I was in the middle of a pandemic there. My usual approach is to make people laugh and I hope make you think with a good story. Maybe get you to think about issues you weren't sure you were thinking of because I, by stealth, got you to think of them, which is always a, uh, one of my goals. Uh, but we were in the middle of the pandemic and I think I was suffering what almost everyone in this room was suffering, a, uh, a distancing from loved ones, social isolation, a bit of, uh, you know, we were discouraged and depressed about our current predicament. We were fearful about what was happening around us. Some of us had close friends and relatives and loved ones who didn't make it through the pandemic. And I just thought if I write another just straight up comic novel uh, that didn't see those people in the story, uh, where if they were reading it, they would say, well, what happened to the pandemic? We just went through this and it's not in this, in this novel. So I actually uh, decided to let the pandemic uh, play a role in this story, and it really kind of kicks it off. So the approach in this novel, taking a page out of John Irving's uh, playbook, is to face my fear. And one of my fears has always been that I might, uh, that my wife might predecease me. Uh, and so I, I thought, had this story in my mind about uh, uh, a, a couple who was about my age uh, and my wife's age and that she would uh, pass away from the pandemic early on, unexpected, uh, a shock. So I decided to face that fear, follow the story, and the laughs go in where they fit. But I, I sort of cast off the shackles of, tyra of the tyranny of humor, uh, in a way you might call it, and I didn't need to make every page uh, funny. Uh, I hope it's funny, but maybe in a more organic way than my other novels. So I, I just followed uh, the story, and I didn't bend it to my will to create situations where humor was the obvious conclusion. Uh, I just followed it, uh, and it took me uh, where I've gone in this story. Uh, and one of the places it, uh, it took me was to a scene. This is very early on, so you, I'm not really giving anything away here. Uh, but uh, the narrator's spouse of some 35 years, I think, in the story... Uh, she was a high-flying mergers and acquisitions lawyer in downtown Toronto, uh, and the narrator was a, was a freelance writer who was a, a sort of a house husband raising their son in the early years. Uh, and uh, she was in a, in a board meeting one day with her clients, and she felt some symptoms. She knew what the symptoms were. Uh, she's no-nonsense, thoughtful, intelligent person. She drove herself to the hospital. The early days of the pandemic in Toronto, uh, and she never left the hospital. And of course, in those early stages, uh, it also meant that her husband and their son, they were never in the same room together. And some of you may have had that experience with loved ones. Uh, thankfully, I think we're past that stage now. But in her final uh, days, she, in a spasm of selflessness, she was far more concerned about her husband than she was about herself probably because she knew what was happening to her. Everyone around her had come into the room and then had been wheeled out of the room. Uh, she knew the trajectory she was on. So she, uh, she recorded a, a video on her phone and she sent it to her son and their son and said, you know, I'm worried about your father. If he's not back on his feet after what seems like a reasonable time, and you decide that, Will, uh, you know, break glass in case of emergency, you can play him this video. And that's what happens. And in essence, what she says in the video is, don't let my death define your life. Go to Paris like we planned. They had family trips planned to Paris, two of them that were thwarted by family calamities that sometimes happen. Uh, so the narrator is obsessed about Paris and or with Paris and has never been. So they were going to go. So she's saying him, go to Paris and find somebody. You're not good on your own. You're better with somebody. You're wondering where that story came from or that idea? Where did I get that idea from? Well, meet my mother. I have two cousins here who, uh, who remember her very well. Uh, that's my mother. Uh, she was married in 1957 to that really tall guy next to her. They have both passed away now, but my mother passed away far too soon. She was 68 when she passed away, and I was in the room where she was in palliative care in our home. It was actually the bedroom that my twin brother and I shared for our childhood. And not long before she, uh, she left us, she, she said to me, you're going to have to help your father find somebody. He's not going to do well on his own. And I went, 
what? What are you? Like, it's a very odd thing for your, to hear that coming out of your mother's uh, mouth. Uh, so I got the idea from her. She gave it to me. That's how they looked uh, a little later in life. So what's the story behind this story? Well, John Irving and my mother are behind this story in a way. Uh, but there are some more connections to my, my own personal life in this. The narrator's name, for instance, Jack McMaster. Well, this doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure this out. Uh, I went to McMaster. <clears throat> I went to McMaster. It was a pretty uh, life-changing uh, time for me. Uh, I got, I, I studied, I have an engineering degree from McMaster, but uh, I, I don't even, when I think of my time at Mac, I don't think about my engineering degree. I, I think about uh, my life in student politics. Uh, and I spent six years uh, at McMaster getting my four-year degree. Um, I wasn't, I didn't fail anything. It was just that one year I was vice president of the students' union and constitutionally, I was only allowed to take a half course load. So that extended my time by one year. Uh, and then uh, when I was rounding the clubhouse turn, and uh, actually I was about to get my iron ring, so I was essentially graduating, I ran for president of the Students' Union and somehow uh, in a, you know, ill-advised on the student body's part, they elected me. Uh, so yes, there I am, back when I was thinner and my hair was thicker. I seem to have suffered a reversal in fortunes on both fronts in the intervening years. So that's the McMaster part, not an uncommon surname. So, uh, But the Jack comes from this guy, Jack Evans. Uh, he was the senior university official with whom I had most of my dealings as president of the Students' Union. We didn't always agree, which is no surprise to anyone who's worked in student politics, dealing with the university administration. But uh, he really did understand the student perspective, our, our discussions, our negotiations, even our fights never strayed from the premise of mutual respect. And we were very fond of one another. And we kept up a good friendship for 40 years or more. Uh, we would see him at least once a year for lunch, a, a group of student politicos from his era. Uh, and he passed away uh, just in, in 2022, and I was privileged to speak at his funeral. So in a way, I was honoring him and my time at McMaster with the name of my narrator. Now, that's not mentioned really anywhere in the novel. That's just for you. But, uh, uh, but I, I often have fun with names that are a little private meaning for me in, in the names. Uh, aging. Yes, aging. I've been coming to grips, as I mentioned, with, uh, with being as old as I am. And like the narrator, though I'm not the narrator, I think I, I feel like I'm about 35 still. Except, and this is the device I use in the novel, over the course of the novel, all the way through, my narrator says, I just feel like I'm 35. And then he's reminded occasionally of instances when he doesn't feel 35, like his recovery time after ball hockey. Uh, I do play in the ball hockey league that's depicted in this novel. We have a game once a week. It's a very good thing. It's once a week. <laughs> it takes me the full seven days to recover so I can go back out there on the floor uh, the following Tuesday. Or, gentlemen in particular, nocturnal bathroom visits all of a sudden are on the rise. Uh, I can no longer sleep in. I could sleep the entire day when I was younger. Now I wake up, whether I go to bed at midnight or at 1 or at 11, I wake up at 5 or 5.30 and I'm sort of scrolling through my iPad until day breaks. Or what about how colorful our bruises are now? <laughs> I tell you, the artwork on my body <laughs> in the week after a ball hockey game and just the evolution of the bruises as they change in shape and size and particularly in color, uh, it's quite extraordinary. So over the course of the novel, he goes through, I think, about uh, a dozen uh, moments or you know, scenarios where he doesn't feel like he's 35 anymore. And that's just him coming to grips with being 62, as he is in the novel. I'm now 63. But. Male friendship. Uh, I wanted to explore this because I've had an interesting experience. I joined this league. My twin brother and I joined this league. There we are. I just put those in to sh let you know that we won the championship twice recently. <laughs> um, uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, we joined the league in, uh, when we were 43, so in 2003. 
And when you're at that relatively advanced age, you don't expect in the succeeding few years to gather around you a, a couple of dozen of really solid, close, important friends. Uh, I mean, that doesn't really happen unless you have this artificial vehicle of a, of a ball hockey league. Uh, and these are guys who are important to us now. When their parents pass away, which we're all at that age now, you know, we go to their funerals. Uh, when somebody gets sick uh, in the league, you know, a committee swings into action and a meal plan is developed and meals are delivered. And it's not really about the hockey. It's about the community of friends that have uh, grown up around this league. So I wanted to explore that because I don't think we do friendship very well as guys. We're too locked into how we've been streamed in society to be the strong, silent type. The only time we can hug a friend is if they've scored a goal uh, and we can hug them with our equipment on. Um, and, but that's changing now. I do a, I'm a much huggier person now than I once was, and it feels good. I have a, one friend in the league. Uh, when he hugs me now, we hug, and then about half the time he kisses me on the cheek. It was a bit odd when it happened the first time, but I'm, I'm getting kind of used to it now. <laughs> But I think we need that kind of physical touch with our own friends the way, uh, I mean, women have no hesitation, right, of doing that. So uh, I'm learning about friendship, and I wanted to explore that issue in this novel, and I, I've tried to do that. Songwriting. In my eight novels up until now, I've never written about music and songwriting, even though it's been a big part of my life since I was uh, 17 years old. Uh, I learned to play guitar when I was 17. I've been writing songs since, uh, since I was 17. Uh, most of them I remember, some of them I don't, generally for good reason. Uh, but it's a very private uh, kind of uh, passion for me. Uh, very few others have ever heard my, uh, my songs. Uh, maybe a handful, my brother has heard them. He sometimes played on them if we've recorded them. Uh, I did play in a band in university. Uh, that's a bit more public, which was odd for me. I started out as the lead singer in the band. It was a bunch of my engineering colleagues, classmates, and I. Uh, we formed this band, uh, and it was a little heavier rock than I'm used to. And when I was given the task of singing Jethro Tull's Aqualung, uh, we did the performance, uh, and then afterwards there was a bit of a delegation from the band that said, you know what? Terry, you kind of hail from the Ann Murray school of singing. <laughs> Maybe we should think about auditioning another singer. Don't, no offense. And believe me, I was relieved. I was not offended. Um, I, as I like to say, I'm just good enough to know that I'm not good enough. Uh, so we did, we auditioned on campus. We auditioned uh, a fellow Mac student. Uh, anyone familiar with the band The Sky Diggers? Yeah, a great, great Canadian band, been around for 35 years or something now. Well, the lead singer in our band was the co-founder uh, of the, later became the co-founder of the Sky Diggers, Andy Mays. That's he screaming into the mic over on that one picture. Great guy. So we uh, always rib Andy that we gave him his start in music. But, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's unusual for it to take eight novels before I write about something that's played such an important role, though private, in my life. So I finally wrote about songwriting in this, uh, in this novel. In fact, there are two original songs in the novel. Uh, the first uh, that comes up, I think it's the first one that comes up, is called More Than the Game. Uh, it's my love song to the ball hockey league. Uh, and uh, I wrote it about well, what's that, 13, 12 years ago or so? I think the thrust of the, of the message in this song is in the bridge. When the season finally ends, what rewards have we reaped? Look around and count your friends. That's the score we keep. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of fun to... I, I played that song once in a while for some of the folks in the league, but, but not many, so... Um, and the second one is a 42-year-old song I wrote while I was at McMaster... I had just fallen hard for this uh, young woman I had met when I was campaigning in her wet residence. Uh, she opened the door and uh, invited me to the floor party that night. I ditched the rest of the pamphlets I was supposed to be distributing <laughs> and went back to the party. Uh, about two months after we started dating, it was Christmas time, and she went home to Nova Scotia for uh, her, her family where she lived. 
which is what most students do. They go home to their family for Christmas. I still had another exam to do. I was on campus and I was missing her terribly. Uh, and nothing like emotional angst to ramp up my songwriting inclinations. And I wrote this song called Until the New Year, uh, because that's when she would be coming back. Uh, and I remember, I don't remember writing all my songs, but I remember writing this one. I was in my residence room uh, and it was dark, late at night, it was dark, I had a little lamp on in the room. Uh, I had strung up Christmas lights in my window uh, and I could see the moon and the clouds going across the moon in front of me. And sometimes lyrics are staring you uh, in the face. So there's a lyric in there. And winter clouds surround the moon as colored lights frame my thoughts of you. That just takes me back to that moment sitting on the bed writing, writing that song. Uh, so that song has stayed with me over the years, largely because she stayed with me, I think. Uh, we've now been married for 36 years. Uh, so... Um, Come back to the audiobook in a minute. Um, Jim Cuddy. I'm sure there are some Jim Cuddy fans in the audience. Jim Cuddy is the only real character in the novel. And he's in the novel, uh, well, for a specific reason. Uh, people have often asked me, how did you get Jim Cuddy to blurb your second novel? And I said, well, it wasn't that hard. I leaned over on the bench after a particularly arduous shift when he was hyperventilating and quite uh, vulnerable and asked him if he would read my second manuscript. And I, I think the grunt was in the affirmative, uh, but uh, he's, uh, he is a very good guy. And everything you've heard about him being a nice guy and the guy who's on stage is the same guy who is off stage is all true. Uh, when I finished the novel, the manuscript, I emailed, uh, emailed Jim and I said, you know, I, you're included in this novel uh, and uh, I hope you don't mind, but I'd like to keep you in it. If you don't want to be, I could just do a search and replace and come up with a new name for a Canadian rock singer, uh, folk rock singer. Uh, and he emailed me back 20 minutes later and said, I don't even have to read the manuscript. Go ahead and, uh, and use my name in the novel. I, I trust you. Perhaps ill-advised on his part, but <clears throat> I kept that email just in case. <laughs> But uh, anyway, he, he plays, he has a few cameo appearances in the, uh, in the story, and it's lots of fun that he's there. Um, Paris in the 1920s is part of this novel. I've been fascinated by Paris in the 1920s probably for about 15 years now. Uh, that collection of books on the bottom there, those are just my books about Hemingway. And if, if you can imagine, I don't like Hemingway's writing, and I don't like him. That's why I only have that number of books uh, about him. Uh, but you can't dispute his impact on, uh, on literature. The 1920s in Paris, that was the place to be. Uh, a confluence of artists gathered there, painters, poets, writers, dancers, artists. Uh, and in a way, they reshaped the cultural landscape in the wake of the Great War. Uh, Europe was, was ripe for change. Uh, and Hemingway and Fitzgerald uh, really helped usher in a new kind of writing, modern, postmodernist writing. Uh, and I don't, I don't like that kind of writing because Hemingway, you know, you can have a grade two education and enjoy Hemingway, which is, you know, that's, that's something, that, that's important. He writes such barren, spare, simple prose, whereas I hail from the why use six words when 12 will do school of writing. <laughs> I like to splash around in the English language and sort of explore its outer reaches. So I'm not a fan of his writing. Uh, that guy in the middle, that's Morley Callahan, uh, a great uh, Canadian novelist. Uh, and I'll come back to him in a minute. And that map of Paris, that's a 1928 map of Paris that's framed and sits right above the desk where I, I write. And I seldom lack for inspiration, even if I'm getting bored with what I'm writing, uh, I can just look up onto that map and, uh, and see the streets that these writers and artists, uh, you know, ambled down and cafes they drank in. <laughs> so it's an it's a en endless source of inspiration for me. The thing about Paris is it is a time machine. Uh, these shots were taken in 2020, uh, the last time I was in Paris. No, actually, I was in Paris last year, so 2022. Um, but it looks the same, like really... The architecture, the way the city is laid out, 
These cafes that the lost generation writers frequented, Le Dome, La Rotonde, La Coupole, Les Deux Magots, Bozerie de Lila, Brasserie Lip, they're all exactly where they were then. They might have a new awning or a new sign out front, but inside, they're all almost exactly as they were then. So you can literally walk into those cafes. And I, I once wrote a scene in, in one of my novels uh, about uh, Les Deux Magots from a seat in Les Deux Magots. I was sitting in Hemingway's favorite uh, table there when I, I wrote it. Uh, so you can do that kind of thing in Paris. Um, there's a character in this novel named Elizabeth Callahan Hughes, uh, Cal and she goes by Callahan. Uh, she's one of the fa my favorite characters I I've ever written, and I hope you enjoy her when you come to meet her in the story. But she's named after Morley Callahan uh, because her grandmother, when she was 18, Callahan's grandmother, uh, fled the strictures of her wealthy family's existence in England and came to Paris at the age of 18 as an aspiring poet with the single goal of infiltrating the lost generation of poets and writers uh, and, uh, and sort of living the artistic life. And she kept diaries for the next 10 years uh, and uh, she bequeathed her apartment to Callahan Hughes, her granddaughter. And that's where Callahan lives, she's an artist. Uh, and these diaries, uh, obviously it's a fictitious character and the diaries are fictitious, but it was wonderful to write to try and capture the voice uh, of a young woman in the 1920s in Paris. Uh, some of the diary entries are in the story, but her diaries uh, play a role. There's a bit of a mystery, a hundred year old mystery in the novel uh, that I had fun with. Um, but uh, Morley Callahan was good friends with Hemingway. Uh, they worked together in the newsroom of the Toronto Star in the 1920s. And Hemingway, for all his, his warts, uh, he could be a good friend to aspiring writers until they became a threat to him, and then he was no longer a friend. But he saw something in Callahan's writing and helped him land a publisher for a few of his short stories before he wrote his first novel, and he encouraged Callahan to come to Paris. He finally did later than he wanted to, but Callahan and his wife Loretto spent the summer of 1929 in Paris, uh, and he would hang out with Hemingway. And of course, Hemingway has been a boxer since he was in high school. Not a great boxer, more of a brawler, but uh, he fashioned himself to be quite a talented boxer. He boxed his entire life. And in that summer of 1929, Callahan and Hemingway would go to the American Club in Paris, and they would spar three minute rounds and just to stay in shape. And one of these is a very famous story about one afternoon they were sparring and late in the round, Morley Callahan clocked Hemingway. And Call Callahan was this small wiry guy, but he knew how to box. He was on the U of T boxing team when he was in law school. Hemingway was just a big brawler who thought he could box. And this small wiry guy knocked Hemingway on the canvas bloodied his lip, he was dazed, and as Hemingway staggered to his feet, his he-man reputation under threat, uh, the timekeeper said, oh, sorry, guys, I let that round go to four minutes. And Hemingway was incensed. He'd never been on the canvas before and wouldn't have been had a three-minute round been observed. And it severely damaged for a long time Hemingway's friendship with that timekeeper. And that timekeeper was F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not kidding. It was a big deal. Hemingway and Fitzgerald wrote to Callahan in the months afterwards when a story came out in Esquire magazine about the match, uh, the sparring, and demanded that he set the record straight. I mean, that's how petty Hemingway was about his reputation. Anyway, I think the most accurate portrayal of that event can be found in Callahan's wonderful memoir, That Summer in Paris. It's, uh, if you're interested in that era, it's well worth a read. Um, why don't I read you a little piece from the novel? Uh, by the way, I should tell you that in the audiobook, which I, I recorded, uh, those two original songs have been laid into the, uh, into the audiobook, right where the songs come up. We recorded the songs. Okay, I recorded the songs, uh, which... Uh, 
that took a lot for someone who uh, to think that these are now in the audiobook out there in the public is uh, uh, is quite difficult for me as someone who has this private hobby of songwriting. Um, but they are there. I, I have recordings. Um, if there is an appetite, we could listen to one of them if you think that's a good idea. I might leave the room if you agree. But uh, um, but if we want to listen to one, then I could read a piece for, from the novel. Does that uh, make sense? <clears throat> I'll just hide behind the poster here. All right, so why don't we do the 42-year-old love song for my then new girlfriend and now wife of 36 years. This is until the new... <laughs> sappy, but I was 21 and in love. Why don't I just give you a little taste of the story and then we can uh, uh, have some questions if I haven't already exhausted our time. Um, I'm going to read right from the very beginning, <clears throat> uh, and then I'll read the first half of the novel. So. No, I won't do that. I'm just going to read a page and a half just to give you a bit of a flavor of the, 
you know, some of the humor, I hope, and uh, but the melancholy that hangs over at least the first half of the story. Then it takes an upward trajectory, and you know you can always count on me for a happy ending. So this is uh, chapter one. Now that's using your face, Jack Mack, a spectator shouted as the buzzer sounded to end my weekly ball hockey game. To be clear, I actually knew who yelled from the sidelines, but let's just go with a spectator, shall we? Why encourage him? My teammates gathered around to congratulate me on the winning goal. Yes, it's true. For once, I was the hero. Let me give you the slow motion replay of my big moment in case you're blissfully unaware. And also because my clutch goal, spectacular though it was, did not make the highlight reel on SportsCenter that night. With the game tied in the final minute of play, I had assumed my position in front of the net to try to screen their goalie. The ball found, somehow found its way back to our, one of our stronger defensemen, and I watched him wind up for one of his terrifying slap shot as, shots as I trembled in the firing line. My mission, and I chose to accept it, was to try to deflect the ball to make it even tougher for their goalie to stop. Miraculously, the blade of my stick caught a piece of the orange plastic sphere as it whizzed towards the net at a speed that had me waiting for a sonic boom. It was sort of a good news, bad news, good news scenario. I did deflect the ball, good news, but right into my own face, bad news. That may sound painful, but for years I've worn a full wire cage on my helmet. Smart, right? So the ball bounced harmlessly off my well-protected face and into the net to win the game with about two seconds left on the clock. Good news again. It used to be that my ball hockey game was a high point of my week, which is saying something for a guy who had just about everything I could have ever desired. My life was nearly perfect. That all changed two years five months and 14 days ago. Despite it all, I still loved and needed my ball hockey and the roughly 90 guys who made up the six teams in our community league. In fact, I think I needed the game and the guys more than ever. You see, for an hour or so every week from April to October, my mind was completely and singularly focused on playing the sport I've loved since I was about six years old. Okay, let me spell it out. It was an escape. An escape for just a brief moment each week, but an escape nonetheless. It was only after the game and after the post-game analysis at our local watering hole that reality returned and settled over me like falling ash from a volcanic eruption. Let me just stop there. Um, just before we finish, a bit of a plug. I have a bi-weekly newsletter. It's actually not so much a newsletter, but it's musings from the front lines of the writing life, you might call it. Uh, I use the, the platform Substack, uh, but every second Sunday morning, you will get a, an email from me. A few of you are subscribers already, I know. There's lots of, fo lots of photos. <clears throat> Sorry, voice giving out. Uh, I'm recovering from something, not what you may think. <laughs> I test every day. Um, uh, but uh, so I write about... Uh, you know, the writing life, my travels, other writers I revere uh, and have you know, connected with, the backstories to my novels, the publishing world. It's just, and usually it's kind of fun and there's uh, lots of photos. Uh, if you're interested, the easiest way, easiest way to subscribe is go to my website, scroll down to the bottom of the home page, and there's a little spot where you can just type in your email. It's free and you can unsubscribe whenever you want. But uh, uh, it's called, um, what is it called? A Novel Journey is what the newsletter is called. So thank you for having me back to London. Nice to see you all, but happy to answer questions. I'm looking at Josh. He's giving me the thumbs up. Okay. Any questions? All right. Settle down. There's time for everybody. Well, first of all, I just want to give Terry a very warm thanks for what was a tremendous presentation to start us off before questions. So join me in thanking Terry for that. Okay, so like Phil Donahue, I have to run to you before you ask your question. So wait for the microphone to come to you or else our Zoomers from Zoom land can't hear the question. So who would like to start us off with a question? Come on. Who's going to kick it off? I'll, I'll start off. At, oh, we have, oh, we got one over here. Okay. Thank you for breaking the ice. Now there'll be a deluge of questions. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm curious, you said 
this novel is about aging. So what kind of um, awareness or enlightenment or just thoughts did you gather in writing the book about aging? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I've learned nothing about aging in this process. No, that's not true. No, it, writing about it ha has really helped me. I, when I read the newspaper and I see a story where it said, 63-year-old so-and-so uh, was arrested for sh shoplifting or something, I picture a 63-year-old, but I don't picture me. And I'm starting to picture me now. Uh, so I, I, am, I am totally accepting that I am 63. I just don't feel like it. And I think I even wrote in the novel, uh, when Jack is driving, this, is, this came from me, when you're driving, you're sitting there, you're driving, you're seeing the road ahead of you, does anything feel any different than when you were driving at 35 or at 25? And for me, I, I can't come up with anything that feels different. So I spend a good part of my day forgetting that I'm 63, uh, unless I've had a ball hockey game the night before. Then I'm reminded constantly. Then I feel like I'm 83. But uh, uh, So I, what I've learned is that uh, you better accept it because it's happened and it's true. Uh, and learn to embrace it. And uh, I don't think I, my life is led the way my father's life was led when he was 63 or my mother's when she, she was 63. I think there's something different about uh, our generation maybe, but uh, I mean, my dad wasn't playing ball hockey at 63 once a week, uh, twice a week sometimes. Uh, so I, I'm trying to, to live longer by living a little bit more actively. Uh, but... I accept that I am 63, and in about you know six weeks, it's going to be 64. So, <laughs> the relentless march of time. <laughs> Your thoughts, Next questions, questions, comments. Oh, way at the back oh, there. I see Making it. you run, I see there, it. Josh. Here we go. Here we go. Hmm. Oh, fleet of foot. I try. Terry, will we ever in the future see Angus again on television or any of your other characters? <laughs> ah, uh, will you ever see Angus again on television? That's uh, that's a good question. I'm not. I don't know if they'll be on television, uh, but my phone number is. Uh, operators are standing by for options on film and TV. Uh, I, I would love to do that again. That was a lot of fun being at least peripherally involved with the production. They don't usually want the writer to be too close to it. Uh, but they were wonderful to me, and we had a great time doing it. Um, you may see Angus in an another novel, though. Um, well, let me explain. Uh, I am writing uh, my 10th novel now, and it's not an Angus novel, yet Angus so far is going to make at least a couple of cameo appearances in the novel in his role of Minister of Public Safety responsible for CSIS. Because um, uh, that's at the end of the last novel, you know, he was appointed to that role. Uh, and maybe I had this novel in mind then. I don't think so. I just like to leave my doors open, right? Uh, but I'm working on that, uh, that novel now. So uh, it's not about him, uh, but he's there. And so it's interesting, it'd be interesting to write from a different perspective and sort of meet Angus for the first time. Uh, but he's not in it. It's not really about him, but he'll be there. He'll be there. So I, I hope to see, he's one of my favorite characters. Uh, I hope we might see him uh, on the small or large screen again at some point. Uh, but uh, nothing's happening in the, in the immediate future that I'm aware of. Oh, one sec. <laughs> Here we go. Cross the room. I actually just wanted to make Josh run from the far side of the room yes, over here. Perfect. Just, well yeah, done. That would work. <laughs> um, I think I recalled when you were speaking last year, Terry, you talked about the process you use when you're thinking about a book. And if I recall, you don't put much down to paper before you sort of develop the whole strategy of the novel. Is that? Can you just want to talk about that just a little bit? Sure. This is Ron Kugler, the president of the London Writing Society. I got that right? So any writers in the room, you should join the London Writing Society. Um, yeah, I, I am a, an engineer by academic training, as I already mentioned. So uh, engineers don't build bridges without blueprints. I don't write a novel without a blueprint. So I'm very much a, an ardent, inveterate planner. Those of you who know about the writing spectrum, planners over here, 
pantsers at the other end, those who write by the seat of their pants. And I don't say that in, in a derogatory or derisive way. Some of our finest novelists write that way and, and write finer books that I, than I will ever write. Uh, but I'm very much a planner. So, yeah, there's my new novel. I have about four pages of notes, and the whole story is, is uh, percolating, fermenting, steeping in my brain pan now. Uh, and I will be starting to outline that in earnest, probably starting in January. And I'll wind up with an 85 or 95 page scene by scene bullet point version of the novel. Uh, and I work on that for far longer than I work on the manuscript. Uh, and in the last two months or so of the process, I'll put that 95 page scene by scene bullet point version of the novel on one side of my screen, a blank page on the left side of my screen, always that way. Uh, and then I will write the manuscript almost in a fevered sprint. Uh, I'm so keen to get to the writing. Uh, and some writers aren't interested in writing the story once they know what the story is. It's coming up with the story and writing through the story that keeps them interested. To me, I'm, I'm not like that. I, I like all aspects of the writing process, but I particularly like trying to find the right words to lift that bullet point version off the page and turn it into prose. Uh, and it allows me to commit all of my questionable cerebral powers at that stage in the process to crafting sentences. I'm not worried about what my characters are doing next. Part of my brain is not turned off because it's thinking about the next chapter. Uh, I know everything that happens in the novel at that stage, and I can just work on the sentences. And that gives me great uh, satisfaction. I forget what the question was, Ron. But <laughs> that was it? Close. OK, thanks. <laughs> I have a question, actually. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in your presentation is the fact that you had to rebalance levity and gravity to meet the moment of what was happening with COVID-19. Did you discover something about writing that, uh, in your writing practice that took you into these heavy emotional topics that you'll carry forward that you didn't have before in your toolbox? Well, I, didn't, I wouldn't say I discovered something new. It was more that it reinforced the belief I've had about humor writing uh, for a long time, and frankly, it was again John Irving who taught me this lesson, and that is the juxtaposition of humor and pathos, and sometimes rubbing them right up against one another. Those of you who have read Irving will know that he can have you splitting your side laughing in one paragraph, and then he'll hit you with a gut punch in the next paragraph, and you'll have a lump in your throat that you won't know how it got there. And it's the proximity of the humor and pathos that make both emotions stronger by bringing them close together. Uh, and in this case, uh, and you can see that in some of my other novels, uh, Up and Down, my third novel, which is one of my favorites, there's, a, you know, there's actually a death scene in, in Up and Down. Uh, and if you read it carefully, it, it may, it's not really fiction, actually. Uh, so I could write that with firsthand uh, experience. Um, and, but I, I've come to learn that uh, the humor can be higher and the pathos can be more profound if you shove the two of them together now and then. And in this case, it happened a lot more. There was a lot more pathos, but I hope there's still some humor in it because uh, I'm not able to suppress that part <laughs> of my personality when I'm, I'm writing. Uh, but uh, so I hope that it, they reinforce one another in a way. And that, that, re that was something that uh, I was reminded of writing this novel. Somebody in the webinar asked whether Jim Cuddy might be recording one of your songs in the future. Whether Jim Cuddy might be recording one of my songs. Well, uh, I somehow doubt it because I could never ask him. Uh, there's no way, there's no way I could ask him to do that. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's fine. In, in the novel, something sort of like that happens, unbeknownst to Jack, and you'll have to figure, you'll see what happens in the story. Um, but no, I could never bring myself uh, to do that. Plus, he doesn't do a lot of covers, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's a, 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 such a superior songwriter that, uh, yeah, I, I'd rather listen to him recording some of his new songs than, than one of mine. <laughs> Of course, I went to this side of the room, and we're going to go to the other side. <clears throat> I purposely waited until you were in the far <laughs> corner. That's right. <laughs> 
so I too am a graduate of McMaster in physics. Um, and I uh, now understand uh, some of your engineering experiences and how they got into your novels, because uh, some of them have some very interesting components to it. Can you give us a bit of a background as to how you transitioned from engineering into becoming uh, the author that you are? Sure. Let, let me just preface that by saying, if you were in physics, do you remember Professor Taylor, Mr. David Taylor? He had a long, flowing beard and really wild hair. He was one of the physical models for Angus McClintock, <laughs> along with Robertson Davies and Alexander Graham Bell. I put the three of them <laughs> together, but it was Professor Taylor who contributed the lunch-filled beard. And I loved him. He was a great professor, but, uh, uh, and he had this strange habit of, of pacing at the front of the room, but he would pace in a different way. He would walk across this And he'd walk backwards then. And we would watch because there was a garbage can at the end of the room. We thought, OK, it'll take three more trips, and then he'll kick the garbage can. And he did. It was unbelievable. Um, so my trip, uh, I think I knew by the time I was in third year that I likely wasn't going to be a practicing engineer. But when you've done three years of an engineering degree, you're bloody well going to finish it. And I've never had a moment's regret about having an engineering degree and then never having practiced engineering in the professional sense uh, sen since then. Um, the methodological approach to problem solving, uh, sort of the clarity of thought, the discipline, all of which is part and parcel of sort of the engineering profession, let alone getting the engineering degree, uh, has served me really well uh, as a writer. Uh, so and uh, so I, 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 some people have come up to me at signings and said, oh, I'm, so sorry you had to go through an engineering degree and then not use it. I use it all the time. I use it all the time. How I decide how to cut the lawn, what's the most efficient way to <laughs> cut the lawn, uh, just in how I approach problems in my everyday life, uh, separating the knowns from the unknowns. Like I, I apply the scientific method. Uh, so I'm still very much an engineer, though I've never practiced it. And that you know, feeds into my writing. But even through it all, I, I've always enjoyed uh, writing. And my father engendered in all of his offspring a love of the English language, a reverence for the English language. And uh, we would sit around the dinner table on Sunday nights and debate the geopolitical implications of the split infinitive and, and other important and pressing matters. It did cut down on dinner guests. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, a love of language is all is sort of part and parcel of it, it's the roots of a writer in a way is a love and a reverence for for language, and I I, uh, I attribute that to my father. I was going to say I blame my father for that, but I thank my father for that. Uh, so correcting the the grammarian in me and made up words that we now see out there uh, that just drive me insane. Uh, my father continues to roll over in his grave on a daily basis. People use the word fulsome incorrectly. Look it up. <laughs> it is not a synonym for fuller. <clears throat> but that's how it happened, just a love of language and, and a love of funny novels that I started reading when I was quite late in my 20s. I didn't read much fiction before that, but uh, that's when it started. Thank you. Oh, we've got a couple more over here. Where am I? Oh, see? There's two way. You go in the middle pass. How do you decide the images on the cover of your books? Do you have a say in it, or do you, you see images, like you create them in your mind, and you find somebody who can? It, it's a really good question. And I'm not a good cover design guy. The, the bottom line is I, tend, I probably don't have very much influence over the, cult, the, the cover. Um, I've never asserted it to uh, a, a particularly high degree. I have talked about color. Uh, I can tell you something about this, this cover in a minute. But uh, uh, my ideas for cover tend to be far too literal. And that's maybe the engineer again. Uh, but they have a, a great design team at uh, McClellan and Stewart Penguin Random House. And the designers, they read the novel. Uh, and then they... They do talk to me about what kind of feel I want. 
Uh, this one has sort of less of a comic feel to it than some of the other covers might have. Uh, and that's obviously intentional. When I first got this cover, uh, this is quite similar to the first version, but the guy was quite, he was thicker and his neck was very thick. <laughs> it's hard to describe, but uh, he was like a heavier set guy. And uh, he didn't look like a guy who played ball hockey once a week uh, for the last 20 years of his life. Uh, so they, they tweaked that character at my, I'm going to say my request, probably more my suggestion. They're kind of in charge of that. Um, I imagine if I had you know, kicked up a fuss, we would do something different. But uh, I don't really know how much influence I have, is the clear, the, the short answer. Um, so they have some ideas. Sometimes I get three or four different scenarios, and we sort of say, well, this is closest work on this and they'll tweak that. And, uh, but it's kind of a back and forth, but there's nothing more exciting when that cover, those cover options arrive. Cause I have no idea what they're gonna come up with. So it's funny about this cover, somewhere in the novel, um, the diaries that I made reference to, one of the storylines is that there's a possibility that they might be published for scholars to have another firsthand look at that generation, the lost generation. Uh, and Callahan says at one point, we don't want to, I, I don't, I'd like a cafe on the cover. I don't want the Eiffel Tower. That's just too cliche. And we have an Eiffel Tower on my cover. <laughs> so maybe the art, the graphic designers didn't read it all the way through. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Josh, right there. Oh, whereabouts? Oh, there we are. I was hoping that I would uh, get the microphone immediately after your little speech about words and language, because I have a question for you about words and language. Uh -oh. This is um, an audience of people who love words, as I do, but I have a problem, and maybe you can explain it. What is the origin of a Canadianism which I find quite problematic. I would like to, for example, I would like to thank Terry Fallis for, it's my belief that if I would like to thank Terry Fallis, I will simply say, thank you Terry Fallis for whatever it is you've done. And so the origin of the great Canadian phrase, I would like to, could you explain? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I would like to explain. Uh, <laughs> my suspicion is you often hear when people are at microphones and it gives them an extra subordinate clause, <laughs> extra time at the microphone. I would like to thank. I, I know what you mean. It may also be that the, our propensity, our inclination to politeness. Uh, it's maybe it's too brash to say thank you. Say so I would like to thank. If it's okay with everyone here, I would like, <laughs> I would like to thank. So it may be our our natural deferential uh, approach. But I'm with you. It's it's not necessary. Uh, and there are lots of of words and phrases that we use that are not necessary. I would like to eliminate the word utilize from our language. I mean, why would you use utilize when you could simply use use? <laughs> but, so I, I'm with you. Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, a question on the webinar from Brenda who wanted to ask you, uh, what is an obstacle that you have uh, encountered in your writing and what element or aspect of your writing uh, brings you the most joy. Uh, okay, the, I'll take the, the obstacle one first. Um, I don't know if it's an obstacle, but uh, I cringe a little bit when I read my, my very first novel, uh, which changed my life uh, as a writer, so I have great affection for it. But when I was writing it, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I'd never written anything. Well, I'd never written anything. Uh, that was my first, certainly my first long form writing. Uh, and I wanted it to be funny. And I didn't realize that the characters and the story 
that I was developing could carry a, a lot of the weight and they could carry the load and do the, uh, the heavy lifting in uh, but I uh, so I was trying to throw in humor lest you uh, your attention wane and you drift away uh, and so I think there's probably a bit too much humor in it that isn't as connected to the story as I would have liked it to be. Uh, some of it is me pounding a funny line into the ground to make sure that 99% of the people got the funny line instead of 75% got it. I would just keep going. And I, I see that in hindsight. And I talk about that. I teach the humor writing course. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, at U of T now. And uh, I talk a lot about less is more and that the humor should be really organic and, and integrated and part of the story, not something that you bolt on to try and keep the, the writer's attention. So that was an obstacle uh, for me. In hindsight, it was an obstacle. I didn't know it when I was writing it. And in my second novel, uh, it dawned on me that these characters were three-dimensional and the story had, had legs, that I could let the story do that heavy lifting. And I toned down the humor in the second one and many people have reported to me that they think it's funnier than the first one, maybe because less is more. So that's, that's one of the obstacles I think I faced as a rookie writer trying to figure out what it meant to write a novel. But the, uh, the question about what brings me joy, uh, it's funny. There are lots of writers who like only one particular part of writing. Sometimes that's finishing a novel. Uh, but to, for me... That's why I think I have found what, uh, what I love doing most because I like almost every aspect of it. I like coming up with the story. I like mapping it out. I like solving plot problems. Uh, I like uh, developing that scene-by-scene -scene, uh, bullet point version of the novel. I like writing the, the prose, stringing the sentences together and going over it and over it and polishing it. Uh, and I also like doing this kind of thing. Uh, and lots of writers don't like this aspect of the writing life, though other writers in the room will know how important it is to selling enough books to give you the chance to write another book. Uh, it's not enough just to write the novel and hope that it's going to stand on its own in a bookstore and be purchased. Uh, when I, I hear about writers who do that, they're relying on what I call spine marketing. This is the only marketing your book has, is the spine sticking out at the, at the bookstore. And you hope that your spine is interesting enough that someone will pick it off the shelf and look at it. So uh, going to talk about your story, saying yes when you're invited to come places, uh, is part of the writing life. And I'm convinced that uh, my, my works would not be anywhere near uh, successful as I'm blessed to have them be. Uh, if I hadn't said yes when people invited me to come to their book club, to their local library, and uh, to festivals, uh, and to service clubs, and, and senior citizens' homes, you name it, I, I've done them and continue uh, to do them. That's just part of the life. Luckily, I actually enjoy that part, too. So there's not much of it that doesn't bring me joy. And as a festival organizer, I can say when Terry comes, his spirit of generosity makes you want to invite him back because he's such a great guest. I think I saw a hand over here. I uh, clearly don't get out nearly enough because I think it was maybe eight or ten years ago since I've heard you, probably at the Editors Association of Canada, sure. definitely in the presence of your editor, then editor, who has since retired, since most people don't seem to know a whole lot about it, would you talk a bit about the editorial process and how you've experienced, especially if you've had to change editors? Sure. Um, good question. Uh, and thank you for coming to see me 10 years ago with the editors. Uh, I actually spoke to them again this year in the, in the same place, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I was blessed to have uh, as my editor of my first six novels, Douglas Gibson. If there were a Mount Rushmore to Canadian publishing, Doug's face would be one of those carved in the mountain. Uh, he was Robertson Davies' editor, Hugh McLennan's editor, one of them. Uh, he is and always will be Alice Munro's editor, Alistair MacLeod, uh, the last four Canadian prime ministers. I don't really know he was why he was my editor, except that I did know him. Uh, his wife worked with my wife 
uh, and we would have dinner at one another's houses. And I never told him I was writing a novel. Uh, and, and because I'd written a satirical novel of Canadian politics, my first novel, nobody was interested in it. Uh, and uh, so I self-published it. And what changed my life was when that self-published novel won the Leacock Medal that year. And Doug was in the room when the winner was announced. He was there supporting his author, who was a finalist. And he came up finally and said, OK, it's time you gave me a look at this novel, young man, which is what he said. Uh, he is a, a wonderful guy and obviously a brilliant editor. And he was the publisher at McClellan and Stewart for, for many, many years. Uh, and believe it or not, what day? We're Saturday. Two days ago on Thursday, he had a hip replacement. <laughs> so uh, we still see them a lot. I think of him as my editor emeritus. Uh, he edited differently than my, I have had two other editors since him. He was old school editing. He would print it out uh, in manuscript form and there'd be little pencil marks, some of which I could read. Um, and uh, I think the, mo the harshest comment he ever gave, he, he bracketed a paragraph and said, you're taxing the reader's attention here. <laughs> I hadn't even finished that comment before I... I <laughs> I cut it out. Um, I've had two uh, much younger editors since. Bhavna Chauhan was my editor for, I think, uh, three novels. Uh, and she was wonderful. Uh, they, they now use Microsoft Word, and we use search and replace, uh, not search and replace, um, track changes. We use track changes. So uh, when you turn the page and you see a giant swath of red <laughs> down the margin of one page, your heart kind of sinks. And I go, well, why does she want to cut that? And then I would read it, and she goes, oh, OK, I can see why she would want to cut that. Um, I end up accepting about 90%, 95%, maybe 98% of the changes that are proposed by my editors. Uh, on a couple of issues, I, I push back. And when I explain why, they, they always say, oh, of course, we'll do that. Um, so I sometimes have something else in my mind than they might have. Uh, but my new editor, Joe Lee, this is the first time he's, I've edited, he's been my editor uh, for this novel. Uh, he, was, he was very good, too, uh, in the same way that, that Bhavna was. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope they're being, I, I mean, they make the book better. And anyone who doesn't listen to their editors, I think, is, is unwise. Uh, they make the books better. Uh, and I always thank them. Uh, and I always think long and hard, even when I read good reads. Okay, that's something that doesn't always bring me joy, is good reads. Uh, sometimes uh, someone will send me a good reads review, like a one-star review, uh, and, and I'll, uh, I'll read it. And usually I will find something with a kernel of truth wrapped up there in that one-star review. Uh, so I think part of it, uh, maybe being an older writer now, uh, I hope I can listen and read with an open mind. Uh, and so I listen to my editors because they almost always make uh, the book books better. I have time for one more question over here. Ah, Terry, here, I got you in the right spot now, don't I? <laughs> um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, I should tell you that I've written a number of novels, and Terry has been so kind to do a back cover quote for me. And I, I just wondered if at this time in your career where you have this wonderful uh, bunch of novels that you've written, and I've loved every one, do you still have time to do that or do you, what do you do when people like me say hey Terry I need you <laughs> I I usually just say yes um, uh, I'm reading I probably have four or five manuscripts that I've that I'm working through now uh, to give blurbs for because people gave me blurbs in, on my first novel uh, and uh, you know, I, I remember what it was like to be a first-time writer praying that somebody would, uh, would say something nice about the novel to put on the back. Uh, so, yeah, I, I still do that. Uh, maybe I have less time for it, but you make time for it. And, 
Uh, I'm really enjoying the book I'm reading now by a, a writer, a manuscript I'm reading now by a good friend, writer Rod Carley. He's written a, new, a novel that's set in the, in the 1600s in London, Will Shakespeare's in, in the story. And he's really captured the place. Uh, but it's also a very contemporary novel. It's called Ruff, R-U-F-F, which is what the name of those callers were, Ruffs. Uh, and it's very funny, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, so it's it's not uh, a burden. It's often a, a pleasure and a delight to read other writers' works. Uh, and I've never read a manuscript for another writer for a blurb where I haven't been comfortable giving a blurb. And I don't mean a blurb like, of all the novels I've read this year, this is definitely one of them. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, I can always I can always find something uh, to say, kind, something kind to say about the novel. So it was easy with yours because yours were wonderful. No, I, <laughs> no, you should read her series. The three of them now. Then in that, I know you've written more, but but that in that one series of the four four in the Pioneer Woman. Oh, yeah, very good. Oh, this is Elaine Kugler. Elaine Kugler, C-O-U-G-L-A-R. You can go to elainekugler.com. Is that right? <laughs> oh, E-R, E-R. Did I say A-R? I was thinking of Cougar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get everybody to remain seated so that what we're going to do um, is have Terry. Otherwise, we'll, we'll get... Terry bottlenecked right here at the front uh, to come outside into the lobby to sign some books. The Western Bookstore has an array of Terry's books to be signed and to be purchased, uh, and I hope you will grab one to be signed. Um, before before we do that, I would like to say that uh, I would like to say. See, see this is yeah, look at this. You put it right into my head now. I knew I was going to do it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the politeness of it of all. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I truly can say that Terry does make time to come and join us and is one of the most generous guests you could ask for at uh, a festival. A wonderful penultimate event for our festival. I mentioned off the top that tomorrow at the TAP Center for Creativity, we have a reading with Kim Fawner and Francis Boyle, who will be reading with us at 4 p.m. So I hope you will come to the finale event of the festival tomorrow afternoon. But please welcome or uh, join me in thanking welcome. Let's Terry. Let's start again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you.